agreement with the government of Acre, with WWF, and then C4, to undertake a social environmental monitoring of some of the, the what they call green policies and other policies that have happened historically, um, and then um, more recently through some of this impact evaluation type work that we're doing. So we haven't had the impact yet, but I think that's the kind of setup that you need. You need to have the right people on board at the, at the, before you've been, because we're now going back to collect this, this after data. So we now have everybody interested in our findings so that early next year, we can, we're actually gonna be able to get a policy brief right out there um, as soon as the results are done and people are already asking for it. So that's the kind of ideal position that you want to be in. Let's keep our fingers crossed that this actually will work. Um, but there are many other impact stories that have already happened from C4 and other, other centers. <clears throat> okay, uh, thanks so much for your question. Uh, uh, your question was about how the, these are translated. Uh, um, in our approach, actually, we've gotten support actually from the local authorities and the environmental authorities, such as uh, Natural Environmental Authority, and they are providing us with the data, so that is something that we initially thought we would do it alone, but now they are coming on board. So you realize we are doing it at the grassroots level, and they feel the impact of it. So they are now coming on board, and in a way, we are now growing. So thank you so much. Thanks. Um or oh, Tim, you want to answer the question about capacity building in the face of governments that are not supportive of the youth? Uh, thank you so much. Um, the government, of course, it, it, it involves people. And when the government doesn't give you support, the community, of course, will suffer the consequences of problem at hand. And if we have people who are endowed with information, people who got the opportunity to go to school, they have got to change their society. And um, capacity building, so it's not be about only, of course, giving training. If, we, if you have like-minded people in the society, people who are concern about the cost. You can be begin from that nuclei. And that, and that was how, how we began. From a small nuclei, then it will, it will actually spread into um, the, the bigger community. The component of mentoring in youth is very important. That's one, some, one, one thing which, which, which is very big. Mentoring, mentoring, mentoring. I am like this because I was mentored, and I'm still being mentored. And the, and the mentoring that is in me goes out. I'm also mentoring others. So I think that's what I can say. OK, yeah. uh, I want to add into something what uh, Otima said uh, when it comes to capacity building. And this is based on my personal experience of uh, facilitating capacity building, especially in the youth. Uh, one thing that I come to realize is that uh, if we personally involve ourselves in, the, in capacity building them and be part of them so that they don't feel the distance, then they will actively act, participate in it. And um, one of the things that if we do, if, if we develop ideas which are interested to the youth, um, you will realize actually you will have, you will gain a lot, especially when it comes to uh, capacity building. Uh, and uh, even using the, the, the social media, the way uh, the earlier presenter in the morning did, that was Joseph, using social media, we are able to capacity building them. So it's not only being physically there doing it, but also we can involve in those ways that uh, have, are of great interest to the youth. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take a couple of questions again. Okay. If there are no questions, um, I have a couple of my own, just maybe uh, to Easy and to the rest of the panel. When we're talking about mentoring, you know, this has come up quite a bit. But do we have enough role models in this field that can be able to become mentors to young people? Or is it something that also needs to be looked at? 
Yeah, I mean, I definitely think there's enough people, but and are enough people putting themselves forward to be mentors? Definitely not. Um, I think that more people can become engaged and realize that they have something to offer and to offer other people. And, um, and also with mentorship, I think it's really important to keep things up. Like there's no point having a sort of flash in the pan approach, um, but it's about being able to um, contribute to something over time so that you can build something uh, with someone and essentially have a skills exchange. Um, and, but yeah, I definitely say that it's imp that if, um, if you feel that you have something to, to offer, um, or if, you, if a situation resonates with you, then mentoring is the best way forward, as long as it's also sort of sustainable. So I'd say sort of sustainable mentorship is, is sort of the most positive, I think. Thank you. Amy, you talked about the fact that we need a different breed of scientists and that probably the youth now will be the, the best to sort of un, um, understand the links between science, policy, and the needed actions. From your experience at CIFO, uh, is there some sort of program that is designed to build up upcoming scientists? Well, I, I mean, I think that um, it's not, it, it's, it, it's much bigger than C4. I mean, I think that as soon as you can see a model for something, you know it's possible. I mean, you know, when people say scientists can't communicate, well, some of the best scientists I know are the best communicators. As soon as you see someone who can do that, you know that, that, it's, that you can do it. I mean, um, and there are many graduate programs, actually, and undergraduate programs that I know of all over the world where there's a lot of this kind of innovation happening. Um, you know, I can think of people, a group in South Africa, a group in Brazil, a group in the Netherlands, a group in um, Florida and the United States. I mean, there's lots of um, groups that a lot of this kind of um, training for young scientists, the innovation for young scientists is coming out of, coming out of um, these, these academic programs. And so I think the more evidence we have of these kinds of changes, then, then it just keeps going and it becomes the norm instead of the exception. Thanks, Amy. And maybe just a question to Stephen. You spoke about how we should the, use the little that we have to start processes going, but I think as the youth, we usually want big solutions to our problems. So how do we inspire or motivate young people to be able to use the little that they have Okay, thank you so much for that question. Uh, when we talk of little resources, is that um, for, whole, for a very long time, we do cry that we need funding. So uh, when I talk of the little resources, is that um, we can begin with the little that we have. With time, you realize people now come on board and support us. In our case, we realize now the government is coming on board. And sure, soon we will even cut people to support us in our work. So it is just beginning where we are noting the problem and having the seal to go ahead and solve, look for a solution to, for the, the problem. Um, it begins at that grassroots level, but I'm sure if uh, you have that uh, urge in you to, to bring change, definitely uh, with the little resources you are able actually to transform. So it's uh, using whatever we have and then expanding it with time. So. That is the, what I meant actually when we use the little resources that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience before I pose my last one to Otim? Okay. Otim, when you were making your presentation, you talked about how the radios where you come from, they were talking about reconciliation and peace building and that they were not talking about the second war and that you approached them to start talking about the second war. My question is, is there enough interest in those radio programs that you have started? Because sometimes, you know, listenership goes down, even people interacting uh, with, the, with the program, it goes down. But from your experience, how has been the response? Is radio doing a good job in getting people to talk about the Second War? Thank you so much. Actually, um, I talked in around four different radios. 
Communication is all about the information. For a person to change um, the, the way you think, it will depend on the message you send to a person. The message is very important. And um, what happened with, with, with me was that, of course, I spoke in all those radio, and you were asking about the impact of the talks. Yes, it was there. And it all depended on the message I was pass passing to the audience listening. And, and, and you don't just need, need, need to talk, but you've got to follow up. I had a mechanism of follow up. When, when, and, and, and one thing which I did was that I would, you, you, you should encourage feedback. In a radio, you've got to actually let the callers, I mean the, the audience call, so that they tell you, they, they tell you that part of the story. They tell you, I mean, you know, the nitty gritty of the problem, the problem. And in fact, they will even tell you more. They will tell you more practical ways of addressing the problem. So, um, Tembi, it depends on the information and the message. Filtering it and telling it to the audience you intend, you know, the, 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 the message. Yeah. Thank you, Atim. Uh, if there are no further questions, I think I'll just like to ask our panelists to just give us brief take-home messages before we end the session. We'll start with Easy. Okay. Um, I guess my brief take-home message would be um, that youth uh, can and must be empowered, and in order to do that, then uh, people just have to um, organize themselves, be inspired, and believe that they can do it. Sorry. Could you not hear any of that? No. Um, <laughs> So, um, <laughs> I'll say that again. It wasn't that good anyway, so it's just as well, the microphone wasn't on. Um, uh, my, my brief and concise this time um, take home message would be that youth um, must be and can be empowered and that really there are no barriers to action. We should just not make any excuses Groups should be um, organized from the core, and, um, and really it's about perseverance and support through mentorship and the, and the right programs and inspiration. And that's the message. Thanks. OK, thank you. For me, my tech home message is um, uh, the skills that we have, it may seem very technical, but if we engage the youth, they are very enthusiastic to learn about it. So we go and train them they are ready to land and to use that to transform the, uh, our landscape. Uh, the other thing is um, we need to, uh, let us not cry about having a lot of resources. Let's use what we have. So for our kids, if you have if time, spend with the youth. If you have special skills that you can use, go and use with the youth. If you have resources in terms of uh, money or something like that, take and support the youth. That is the best way that we can actually engage the youth in transforming our landscape. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. We are talking about a little involvement in youth in landscape sector. <clears throat> Let us reach out to the youth. Let us make this forum to reach out to the youth. They are eager. They are eager to, con I mean to, to, to participate, to contribute in the course. Let us take the natural curiosity about science in the youth and we build from there. If we do that, then we'll get there. Thank you. Um, I guess mine is that, you know, for the, the young researchers, teach us what this new climate change scientist should look like. Um, you know, show us how to effectively bridge biophysical and social scientists, show us how to work across sectors, show us how to engage civil society and research, how to, to link our work to the policy um, realm. This is, this is still, this is not, we're not where we want to be and we need um, new models, new experiences, new stories to be able to, to, to make us all better scientists. Thank you, Amy, and thank you to our panelists. Join me in thanking the panelists. Thank you so much for the moving stories, for the inspiring words, and for the encouragement for young people to get more engaged in 
agriculture, forest, and landscapes in general. Uh, and thank you to the audience for being such a lovely audience. Can I test you again? When I say GLF, you say... <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay, you're not sleeping. That's good. <laughs> All right, so before we end off, we have a special guest, Bruce Campbell from CCAFS, who has a few words for us. Good. So I was really impressed that almost none of the speakers used many PowerPoints, which is PowerPoints like killing our ability to orate and talk. But then I, I just ask your forgiveness that I want to show you three images. <laughs> so this is the first image. And 2090, scientists do these projections to 2000, 2100. 2090 is really far away, but I found a 25-year-old, and if she agrees to have children on the schedule that I'm going to propose to her, <laughs> and, if, and if her children have children on that schedule, her grandchild will be only 30 years old when this materializes. This is a four-degree warmer world that we're heading towards. I'm a Zimbabwean, and as you can see, Zimbabwe is dark gray a 20% decline in the growing season. I've, I've worked with smallholders in Zimbabwe for 20 years under incredibly harsh conditions where almost you say the only thing to do is to get out of the landscape because it's so tough. 20% decline in growing season is just, it's, it's, it would kill the continent. As you can see, gray over large areas of the continent, 5 to 20% declines the light gray on vast other areas. The green are the few patches where things may improve slightly in terms of growing season. Now, there's highly uncertainty, these, these kinds of projections, but this is potentially where we're heading towards. Now, let's compare that to what's happening at the negotiation. In 2009, there was some text on agriculture uh, calling for w more work on agriculture, and it didn't go anywhere. In 2010, there was a similar kind of text, and it didn't go anywhere. 2011 was historic in that agriculture was mentioned in a single sentence in the Durban Agreement. And that sentence was, let's refer the work to Substa for a decision at COP. Well, historic, I mean, almost no movement, but historic. 2011 in Doha, no movement, and I can already tell you now, there's zero movement on agriculture at this COP as well. So you just want to, on, you know, on Wednesday when I was watching what was going on, you want to give up on it because it's impossible. So if you could just go to the next one. So I totally agree. This is the youth statement in 2010. You've been negotiating all my life. You cannot tell me you need more time. The progress that we see in these negotiations uh, is just impossible. We have to get on and do things. And there's no, no group better to do it than the youth. So I totally support this kind of activism, and the best group to do it is the youth. I'm a scientist, and I'm supposed to pick my words very carefully. I must be sober about it. I must be academic, and I must publish it in Nature and Science. <laughs> but I think it's time to speak out and be more militant. And this is a great article, if you can just look at the next uh, slide. It's in New Statesman, How Science is is telling us to revolt. And there's some nice stories in there about how scientists have reached the end of their tether and agree that the only way forward is revolution. So I invite you to initiate the revolution. <laughs> I'm impressed by the passion that the speakers showed this afternoon. I think there's huge responsibility actually on the youth to actually change the world because the seniors have not left the world in a good place. And by the time Tembi's grandchildren are 30, we do not want that first picture 
on the, on the PowerPoint. So I'm completely behind these proposed outcomes I heard. The youth can and must be empowered. We must use whatever resources we've got and, and really make action on the ground. We, Amy, we must revolutionize research. Research must be in a completely different way, completely different metrics in terms of how it's, how it's measured. And I come from CCAFs, which is the Climate Change, Agriculture, and Food Security Program of the CG, which I lead. And we're trying to do some of those things, to cha really change the metrics, to put large amounts of, of effort into communications, to, to have a real responsibility to work with partners in a proper, proper way and not, return, not be found out that you're the first researcher to come back to a village. So. I, th I think it was a really inspiring session this afternoon, that I, this morning that I heard. It, it's lifted my spirits after I heard the state of the negotiations. And so I thank you and I invite you to revolt. Thank you, Bruce. Here's to the revolution. <laughs> I'm going to start it myself. So before we end off, uh, there's been an ongoing competition that has been running and Peter is going to announce the winners of that competition. At my age, I need to change uh, glasses. Thank you, uh, Tembi. But I have something else also to say. Um, one of the messages um, that also I took home from this session is that change starts with me. Each of you, uh, each of what we as individuals can do. And I'll tell you a story of how actually this youth uh, session happened. Um, the GLF was being planned already a year um, uh, ago, um, and we didn't have a space for youth. So um, the network of young professionals in agriculture research stepped up and said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we actually start a GLF with a youth session? But in that, it is not why part the network, uh, you know, which is not a, an abstract thing, but it's two people. Courtney and Marina, could you step up? These are the two faces, could you step up, please? These are the two people that then took the initiative and said, hey, we're gonna change things, we are young, and we're gonna take Bruce for a ride in his revolution. And um, then we went to the organizers, and, and we went to C4 and CCAFs, and, and said, um, would you mind? And I said, by all means. And then Michelle stepped up. Michelle? Michelle from C4 stepped up and said, I'm gonna help, I'm young. I'm gonna do Bruce's revolution, I'm gonna help. And then we had Cecilia, are you here? Cecilia Schubert. And then we had another young person from CCAF who said, I'm young, I'm gonna do Bruce's revolution, I'm gonna step up, Cecilia. And then Fenderpan says, we're in. You know, we got Tambi, she raps. Uh, <laughs> their rap at that moment was no agriculture, no deal. No, are you ready? No agriculture. No deal. No agriculture. No deal. And now it's GLF COP19. Ah, uh, there we go, there we go, there we go, there we go. But all of that is all fine. This was all in our minds, you know, when we're having a, a drink together, but it also takes money and it takes some funding. So my part, the two people, did the call for funding. And we're all talking about two months before the, the, um, um, the forum itself. Two months before the forum, none of this was in there. So they went around and they actually got uh, funding from CGR, the Global Agriculture Research Partnership, from GFAR, the Global Forum for Agriculture Research, and from CTA, the Technical Center for Agriculture and Rural Cooperation. I mentioned their names, we're good now. <laughs> and then we said, okay, well, you know what? Let's um, live life uh, on a dangerous road. We're gonna make a call for young people to speak up. We're gonna give a platform. It came out in this forum. Young people need to have a platform to speak up. Um, and we made a call um, on, on our websites. We distributed via Twitter and Facebook. And we gave people, young people all over the world, a three weeks deadline to submit a proposal to come here as a speaker. A three weeks deadline. We thought, yeah, you know, 20, maybe 30 proposals we're gonna get. We got 150 of them. 
from people really across the globe. They're all on the landscapes.org website. Have a read. And each of those submissions actually describe a project and a cause that these young people are working on or are passionate about. And we were really impressed about the diversity of these submissions and how these young people around the world, often with the minimum of resources. It was a story of a young person in India who uh, allocated part of their, his study funds, his study allowance, to fund his own um, uh, project in conservation um, of coastal land in, in India. Um, now, we had these 150 submissions. We could only fly a couple of these people into, um, uh, into Poland, into uh, the GLF. So um, we published all of these submissions on the website, and we asked people to vote in a way to give visibility to these proposals. Uh, we thought, nah, if you're going to get 1,000 um, you know, votes, um, it would be fine. We got 13,344 votes. Um, we just counted them last night. 13,344 votes um, for those 150 submissions. So now, um, here are the top five submissions. They will get a prize um, from the public. Um, it was proposal number 97, uh, the potential of introducing agriculture to children, which is from Muftachur Ritsky from Indonesia. The second one is number 89, uh, the entrepreneurial skip, uh, skills for forestry students from Mari Catalina Becerra Leal from Colombia. Then submission number 67, a youth-led co um, collective to educate and empower youth in environmental issues from Samara um, Acevedo from Colombia. Uh, entry number 24, and now we're going already above the 2,000 threshold vote. Uh, more than 2,000 votes for teaching communities on recycling deforestation and environmental protection from Gabo Confidence Mapotzi from Republic of South Africa and the winner, the absolute winner was Isaac Kosege from Kenya on mentorship training programs for farmers, youth and women. Uh, you will see them on, announced on the landscape uh, website. These top uh, five voted submissions, we get a prize from public, we get uh, a copy of the book One Billion Hungry from Sir uh, um, Gordon Conway a book which explains issues related to this conference, uh, which re, um, explains many interrelated issues um, um, which are critical to our food supply. And the book will be sent by Agriculture for Impact, one of our sponsoring organizations. They will also get um, a signed copy of the CGR um, a year report signed by the CEO of the CGR Consortium and get the YPAR t-shirt t -shirt and the notebook. Um, these are the five winners. I thank you again for all of those that voted on the online submissions, 13,344. Excellent. And I hand it back again to you, Tembi. GLF COP19, you! So congratulations to the winners. And to close off, I'd like to thank you all for participating, for the contributions, for the ideas. And I just want to assure you that this is not the end of the conversation, and this is not the end of the ideas that were generated. We are going to develop a, an outcome document, which is going to be on the YPAD website. It's going to be developed by YPAD. But also, some of the outcomes from this meeting are going to go into the big outcome statement of the Global Landscapes Forum, which is then going to be handed over to the United Nations um, UNFCCC Secretariat. So I think our voices as the youth are being heard, which is a good thing. And once again, if you want to continue giving feedback, if you want to continue, maybe you think of something as you walk out of here, you can just go to landscapes.org and give your feedback there. So thank you to the organizers and the partners that have supported this whole process. We will now be moving straight to the opening session, which is in the auditorium, which is on your right as you go out. So those that haven't grabbed their lunch packs, please grab them outside and then proceed to the main opening session. Thank you so much.